One yeah. thing that I think is really important that I've actually, it's a burden of mine to help people reconstruct, which is how they present the gospel yeah. in their evangelism efforts. Yeah. One, because I used to work for a nonprofit ministry in Chicago where I was like a, a mentored mentors that mentored at risk mm -hmm. teams. Mm -hmm. And one of the interview questions I always gave is what's the gospel? And it was amazing to me yeah. that so many of these people who all grew up in church did not know the gospel. Yeah. They would often say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I'm not even kidding. That was the response, wow. which told me that they are a part of yeah. churches and have grown up in churches that have never taught them how to articulate the gospel, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is important because yes. it's by faith in the gospel that we come to know Jesus. And so I think how we articulate yes. matters. Yes, totally. we should have the character, but we also need the content. Yeah. The content right. being Jesus, not not morality, yes. not right. legalism, yes. Yes. Right. not just hell, not right. judgment, right. <laughs> but a person, yes. you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I've told people constantly is in your gospel presentation, it has to be more about God than it is about sin. Come yes, on. we address sin right. because it's a stumbling block to knowing Jesus, but you don't make sin bigger than you Come make on. Jesus. Right. But if Jesus ain't big in your life, he won't be big in your ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. And so yeah. I think we have to make him big in our souls and our hearts, and it'll naturally be impulsive in how we talk about them. The gospel is the good news, and it's good news because there is bad news. Uh, but it didn't start off as bad news. It started off with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then in Genesis 1 and 2, he creates two people to, to love each other, to love the world, to take care of it, to steward, and to love God. Uh, but they end up trusting in the word of a serpent instead of the word of God. And what happens is that sin enters into them. And thus, everybody who was born after these people, primarily Adam, they inherit the same sin disposition. And so because of it, we are all born uh, in opposition to godliness. We don't love God by default. We are not born children of God. We are born children of wrath, as Ephesians says. But the good news is that God in his love already predestined that Jesus would come, that Jesus, uh, God in the flesh, who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and being found in human form. This God lived a perfect, spotless, righteous life. And then he went to the cross. On the cross, he took on the penalty of all of our sin. He was judged in the way that we should be judged. But not only that, he ends up dying. But he doesn't stay dead because how can death be stronger than God? God is obviously stronger than it. So he defeats death and sin and rises from the grave, meaning that he is more powerful than everything and everyone on this earth. And he offers his hand of salvation and says, all who repent, meaning to turn from their sin and believe, meaning to place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And that is the gospel. It's the best news in the entire world. And delivery is so important. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. I remember the people that were so kind to me. Yeah. And at the same time, I remember the people that were harsh yeah. with the gospel. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, um, if the joy of the Lord is deep <laughs> inside of you, you need to tell your face to yeah. show right. it because there's something wrong. Yeah. Well, we're having that situation actually being a little transparent at our church right now where because we're so focused on really shifting the culture of our church, which was very legalistic, very judgmental, we're focused on shifting that to one where we mm -hmm. lead with the person of Jesus and we make sure that we're compassionate so that we could actually help people get to the cross. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've had instances where young people have said, you know what, I'm not going back because mother so-and-so said, you know, I need to pull up my pants or, you know, deacon such and such said, I need to do X, Y, Z. And it's kind of like, all right, look, I understand preference. I get preference, but we have to make sure that the method that we're using yeah. in order to help people mature yeah. <laughs> is not one that's punitive because people resist that. They do, yeah. too. Every time. Yeah. Think about even like the times that we live in is there's so many needs in our community. Always. Right? So I think part of our job as a church is to actually discover the felt needs mm -hmm. in a community. Right. Not every church needs a food bank. If that's not the felt need in your so community, true, right? yeah. what is the need? And, yeah, and so right. we started asking questions of social workers and police. What do you yeah. need from us? Where yeah. in your community? And so, you know, homelessness and the foster care system, right? So, yeah. and dealing with some of the prison reform, the recidivism. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, th those are the needs where we're putting our hands. And the thing is, when you, you do that, right? When you actually start reaching into communities, then people go, who are those people? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we found exactly. people come to faith 
in Jesus because they saw his people yes. Yes. Put it, getting their hands dirty yes. in the right. community, right. Right. taking church outside of right. the walls in real ways. Right. Discovering the needs of community is, uh, it's not that difficult if um, you ask some questions and open your eyes. You know, so for us at our church, we started asking questions of our police department, of our, the social services department. Uh, what were the specific needs that surrounded our church and how could we help? We went to some schools in the area, how could we help? Instead of coming in assuming we knew what to do, we asked how we could help. And I, that's what I suggest you do, whether it's your connect group or your church. Um, there, there are so many needs. Um, just ask how you can help. I promise you, you'll get an answer. And at first, it's interesting, at first, uh, when we went in just to a school, we just said, hey, we just want to come in and clean the school for you. We'll paint classrooms. What do you need from us? And they're like, wait, what? They were very mistrustful, um, which is kind of sad, but very mistrustful. But we just kind of kept at it. And we said, well, what can we do for you? And they said, well, every child needs an earthquake backpack. So you want to do that? Th they were thinking we would say no. And we went, yep, done. Well, good. Uh, really? So then that's what we did. That was our big fundraiser. We just got earthquake backpacks for all the kids. And so then that gave us access to do more and to help more. And so sometimes it just starts with one thing. So find out what that one thing is. Start there. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. And it's because of you that partner with us that this ministry continues. God bless you.